comfort to my soul Your word Is the truth that sets me free Your word Is a light into my path Well hi there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Alice and myself That's and our brother Mark, who's here with us by video, and all of the folks involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, we want to welcome you and greet you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we do another study today, and our study today is going to be on the subject of faith, a rather important topic indeed. Most important. So we'll start that as soon as I ask God the Father, that you would bless us, Lord. Yes. Lord, that you would put a guard over my mouth. Lord, that you let nothing come out of my mouth that you haven't put in my heart. Amen. Lord, that we would all be blessed by time in your word. Focus on your son, Christ Jesus, Lord God, that we might be more and more like your son, Christ Jesus. Our desire, Lord, is to be pleasing to you. So we praise you and thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit within us who you sent to lead us into all truth. And I pray that all of this would be your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, as I said, the topic is going to be about faith. I, I, I actually call this the mechanics of faith. You know that there are mechanics of faith? I mean, there are things, it's like, it, it, like a car. I mean, there are things that make it work properly, right? right? There are things that make faith work properly in our lives. But I want to start by doing this. You know, it says uh, in Ecclesiastes that the end of a matter is better than its beginning. And normally I always, if you know me and you've been to our Bible studies, that I like to start at the beginning. But today, rather than that, I'm going to start at the end. Because the single most important thing in our life, as I said, is faith. Because it's faith that gives us a right relationship with the Father and with Jesus. Remember, this is the most famous, I think, of all verses is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes, it's a matter of faith. If you don't have faith, in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, the gift of the Father, you're not going to have any kind of right relationship either with the Father or with the Son. Sorry. And remember, you can only, only be saved by faith. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, you know we've been doing an ongoing study of Ephesians for quite some time now. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8. Right? Faith is the gift of God. And remember this, and at the, the heart of the matter today is this. Today, and yesterday, and tomorrow. Is it, it says in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that above all should be our great desire, is to be pleasing to God. All right, so as we get into this, I want to start by telling you, um, you know, I... I flew as an air crewman in the U.S. Navy, and I deployed out of Newfoundland and Iceland as we did searching for Rus Russian missiles and submarines. Don't tell anybody. Um, but the fact was that when I wasn't flying, I was actually the editor of our squadron newspaper. Oh, that's right. The Thunderbolt. Yeah, I, I was in a news business. Mm -hmm. And there's a rule in, in news, by the way, when you're telling a story, that there are five things that you have to have or should have in any account if you're going to give the whole story. Yes. And that's the who, what, where, when, and why of what you're talking about. Now that applies here, right? So we're going to go through this look at faith using that criteria, starting with the who. First of all, who is faith from? Where does faith come from? Well, it says in Hebrews 12, 2, that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. Right? 
He's the author of faith. Faith comes from him. Faith comes from God. You can't make it up. You can't, you can't go to the store and buy it. It has to come from your relationship with him. And who then is faith to? Think about this, what it says in Rome, Paul wrote in Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So the from is from God, right? Mm -hmm. The to is to the believers. Not to everybody. Everybody doesn't have faith. I mean, go out and ask the average person on the street if they have faith. They'll have, they'll have quote-unquote faith in something. Mm -hmm. But it's not true faith. It's just a belief they have from worldly experience. And worldly things will disappoint and fail you, right? Always. God never will. So that's why it says here in that verse, to each among you, to believers. Not to everyone, okay, but to believers. And if you are a believer, your life should be faith-driven, okay? That's the who. The what. What is faith? Well, you know, I'm not going to give you my opinion. And I don't have to, because God has told us right exactly what faith is. Mm -hmm. in, back in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, which I'm sure you probably know. Now faith is the assurance, King James says substance, of things hoped for, the conviction, or evidence as the King James says, of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. So that's what faith is, yes. right? It's the evidence, it's a conviction, it's the substance of what you can't, about things you can't see. Lots of people believe in things because, either because they can see it or because they have seen it so many times they just figure it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. Our faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? It's the assurance of things not seen. So if you can see it, it's not faith. It doesn't take faith to believe in what you can see. Right. It takes faith, the faith of God, to believe in what you cannot see. All right? Where does it... Okay, that's the what. What's the where? Well, where is faith? Again, everything. You know, it says, Paul wrote and said that everything that was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Everything that we need to know, God has given us. He's given us everything, as Peter said, pertaining to life and godliness. You have to get in the habit of seeking the answers to the questions you have in the Word of God, right? So in Romans chapter 10, verses starting in verse 8, right? It says, but what does it say? The Word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So where does faith resolve, reside? In your heart. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It sort of says in Romans 10, 7. But faith is about what's in your heart. Now, that, that's really important because you have to understand that it's not about what's in your mind. Okay? It doesn't go into your mind and go down into your heart. It has to start the other way around. Mm -hmm. All right? And you know what's really interesting about that, that you have to believe with your heart, that we are all born, when we are all born, the heart is the first organ that's developed. Formed. Absolutely. So that, you, that opportunity to receive Jesus is there in the mother's womb. And, and not to get off track here, because I don't think it is off track. You have to remember John the Baptist, it says, was actually filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Yes. How can that be? Because I'm going to tell you something. Don't pay attention to the world. Pay attention to the Word. Children in the womb yes. can hear what's going on. Absolutely. Otherwise, where did John the Baptist get that faith to receive? He had to hear it. He had to hear it. And so there, 
I, I, I plead, I beg you, particularly fathers, when you know that your wife. wife has conceived and is going to give birth to a child, that is the moment you should start preaching and teaching that child. Training him up. Training him up in the ways they should go. That's right. Read the Word of God to your pregnant wife because it'll be going into that child that's being formed. That's right. The first organ that is formed is the heart, and it's with the heart that man believes. So that ch that child, and it is a child because it's a life, can start growing in the Word of God right there. And by the way, it's interesting. I just want to point out one other thing. Uh, I, I read to Romans ten seventeen from the New American Standard Bible, which says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. That same verse in the King James says hearing by the word of God. Now, does that sound like a conflict to you? No. Why not? Three and on the spot? <laughs> no. That's not the reason, okay? The reason is that there's no conflict because Jesus Christ, it says in, the, in John chapter 12, mm -hmm. never spoke anything, mm -hmm. never said anything right. that he had not heard from the Father. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus spoke, you're hear, when you hear the voice of Jesus speak, you are hearing the Father speak to you, right? Unless, of course, what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 15, he said, for the heart of this people, talking about his own people, the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would have seen with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Understand with the heart. We think that everything is about what's going on in the mind. No, it's what starts in the heart, right? Mm -hmm. Believing in your heart. And then, again, going back to Hebrews, I'm going to read Hebrews 5.11. It says, concerning him, Christ, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. If faith comes by hearing, you better make sure that your ears are clean. You better make sure that you are listening to the Lord, all right? Because, you know, way back when in Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament, it said, he said, God spoke to him and said, but they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from hearing. They make, made their hearts like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. When was the last time you had a hearing test? Well, you know what? We all need a spiritual hearing test to make sure that we are hearing from God. Because otherwise, you're not going to have that faith building up. And... It has to be the Word of God. Well, you say whether it's the Word of Christ or the Word of God. I'm going to say this and you prayerfully, receive, prayerfully test this. Mm -hmm. Not everything that comes out of a pulpit is from God. I mean, you, if you've read the New Testament, you should have a clear indication that many false prophets have gone abroad. Mm -hmm. There are many false teachers, many false prophets. That's why it says in 1 John, we're to test the spirits because many false prophets are going. When you hear something from a pulpit, you know, test it. How many times have I said that here? Yes. Don't trust me. Test me. Make sure that what I'm saying to you is the word of God. If it's not the word of God, please do me a favor, pray for me, and write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and let me know what I've said wrong. Because I'm, I am still a human being in the flesh. But I pray, and I pray, like I prayed when we began this. I don't want anything to come out of my mouth that God hasn't put in my heart. All right? Even Paul had people testing him, the Bereans. Absolutely, the Bereans. That's a great example. Paul, I mean, this greatest of Bible teachers, Paul would teach to the, the church at, or the believers at Berea, and did they take his word for it? No. no. They searched the scriptures daily to see if what he was saying was the truth, right? Let me just read that, what I, what I quoted from 1 John. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Into the world. I'll tell you, many false prophets, the world doesn't care about them. Many false prophets have gone into the churches. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. And then, as Jesus would say to the religious people of his time, he said, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep yes. your traditions. That's Mark 7, verses 8 and 9. So, you know, a lot of things you may hear coming out of a pulpit may not be the word of God. It may be the traditions of men. And the traditions of men will not build faith in God in your life. I'm just thinking about that, too. And it seems today the biggest pulpit is Facebook. Well, that's one of the ones, for sure. Be testing that for sure. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, you know... I, I pray you know have a fairly decent knowledge of the word, and that's why we're here is to continue for all of us to grow in our knowledge of the word. That the word says, "Let not many of you become teachers, mm -hmm. for by this you incur a stricter judgment." I, I take that very seriously myself, mm -hmm. but you take this seriously. What Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, the Second Corinthians, he said, "For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received." or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Well, how can that be? I mean, Paul was Paul was foundational in building that church, was there for a year and a half, and then after he leaves, all of a sudden, their, their false teachers are coming in, and the church is accepting what they're saying. He, test it. Test it. Make sure it is the Word of God. It lines up with the Word of God. Otherwise, have nothing to do with it. Or you have to have something to do with it. In love, gently go and rebuke those people who are teaching. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul continued and said in 2 Corinthians 11. Right? Now, I want to make sure that you're clear, too, on this. Because this is an important issue when it comes to faith. You have to hear what God says to you. Yes. All right? There are things that God says that are not to you. Now, they can be for you. And we'll talk about that. Think about Lazarus. I've heard people say over and over and over, you know, that Jesus, when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, it says he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! And then Holland, come forth. That's two statements, by the way. Mm -hmm. Because when he screamed out or hollered out Lazarus, Lazarus came to life. Still in the tomb, but he came to life, right? People have said, well, all that, have you, had he not said that, had he not said, now Lazarus, mm -hmm. then all the dead would have raised. That's so untrue. You know why? Because nothing happens in your life until you hear God speak to you. to you. You have to know that He's speaking to you, and you have to you have to be willing to hear. When I was a little boy, as you say, long, a long time ago, a little turin, <laughs> and I'd be out playing, and maybe my mother would call me and say, "You know, it's time to come in to eat, or time to come in, and it's bedtime." You would have thought that I had mud in my ears. I couldn't hear anything. I was deaf. Mm. But let my mother call me and say, you know, dessert's ready. And like a bullet. Like a bullet. Because we can be very selective in our hearing. We're very good at hearing what we want to hear. And can be very poor at hearing what we don't really want to hear. Now, you've got to be careful about that, right? There's a difference between what God has spoken to you and God has spoken for you. Now, if you're going to get to really grow in your faith, you need to understand this. It says in Romans 15, 4, that whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Everything that was written was written for us, for our instruction. But in John, the third letter of John, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, 
Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. I'm going to tell you, I've heard that verse abused so very many times. Because I've heard preachers and teachers and people, and they go around and say, well, listen, the scripture says God wants you rich. He wants you to, that's not what it is. Now, maybe he does, but you have to hear him say that to you. Here he's saying it to Gaius. Why would he say it to Gaius and not to you? Well, Gaius was a man who had a reputation throughout the entire New Testament church for his hospitality, his generosity, and his faithfulness to God. Yes. So God knew, and well, James, John, he knew that if God blessed Gaius, it would be used faithfully for God's purpose. That's not true of every one of my Christian friends. I mean, it's like God gives you something, oh boy, this is all for me. It's not. So you have to be able to distinguish what's written to you and what, what is written for you. Because otherwise we'll get into this problem with, and it can be a problem, positive thinking, mm -hmm. right? Positive thinking is based on not hearing God speak to you, but just on what you wish God had spoken to you, all right? Is there anything in the Bible written, you want to give you positive things? Thinks? That sounds like Peter Sellers. The same thing is true of positive confession. Now, you should have a positive confession, but a positive confession is that Jesus is Lord. That's right. And that faithfulness. Okay? You have to rightly divide the Word of God. Okay? That's what, what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, you know, you got to rightly divide the Word, because you can wrongly divide the Word of God. I've talked about this a lot of times, and you know you can go check this out. You, are you aware of the fact that the Bible says either two or three times there is no God? Well, it happens to say that only the fool says in his heart there is no God. So if you only take part of that verse, that that glorious truth of God becomes an entire lie. Half a truth is a whole lie. A half a truth can be a whole lie. There are things in the Bible you would never want to hear spoken to you. In Isaiah 14, I'm going to read from verse 12. This is, this is like God speaking directly to Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. That's a pretty positive confession. That's very positive. Very positive. But then God says to him, Nevertheless, you will be thrust down the shoal to the recesses of the pits. You can't make things happen. You know, yes, you're supposed to have a positive confession, and you should be confessing what God has spoken to you, and that you know to be true in the Word of God. But the fact is, you can't speak things into existence. God is the one who does speak things into existence. The one who takes things that are not seen and speaks them into existence so that they can be seen. All right? So in, in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, This is the confidence which we have before him, before God, right? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have made, which we have asked from him. You don't, you should not. I pray that you don't have confidence that God will answer everything that you say because you want it. All right? Paul had this incredible revelation of God. Yes. And because of that, one of the things that was going on in his life as he traveled. He was under attack, being attacked and attacked and attacked by a thorn in the flesh, right? So Paul went before God. Paul was a man of prayer. Paul was a man of faith. And he asked the Lord to remove it. He said, God, please remove this from me. And there was silence in heaven. So again he prayed and he said, Lord, Father, free, please. Remove the thorn in the flesh. Silence in heaven. 
A third time, Paul went, he was persistent, and it's good to be persistent in prayer. Persevere. Paul, persevere. Paul went before God again and prayed, Lord, remove this from me, please. And finally, God answers the prayer. Hallelujah. No! <laughs> that was the answer to prayer. He said, no, my grace is sufficient. He had something better than removing that thorn in the flesh because God used that throughout Paul's life and testimony, right? My grace is sufficient. You like sufficient? Seems like everybody I know in the church is looking for abundance. Pray that God gives you sufficient. It's not always about abundance. Okay, and that was because, let me, let me just read you what it said. Right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read from verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I'm going to tell you, whatever you can ask of God, God has something even better for you. God's desire is not to remove or take from you. God's desire is to give you. He came that you might have life and have it abundantly. But don't think that you always know what true and blessed abundance is. All right, so what have we looked at? We looked at the, uh, the who, uh, the one and where. How about, we, we didn't look at where. We, How we, did where? Well, we didn't look at when. Who, what, when. When. Psalm 46, verse 1 says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth should change and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. He's a very present help in trouble. I've heard so many sermons based on what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith, and they say now. And they're promoting impatience. Patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the blessings of God in your life. So make sure that you're listening to the Lord, okay? Don't be demanding things because he's liable to give you what you want. You know, this is a, a, a political season, isn't it always? Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. And I, I'm put in mind of what happened at Ramah in the, in the Old Testament times. When the people of God, they didn't have a king. No. They had the word of God because they had the prophets and those who were leading them with the word of God. But the people of God came to Samuel, who was a prophet, and said, give us a king that we might be like the other nations. They wanted to be like the world. God granted them that wish. Oh, how they might have wished they had it. Had you know, you might ask for things that, that you really, you have no idea how bad it'll be. That was one case. So that's why... It is now faith. It's, you know what? At the appropriate time, at the right time, God will always be there at the appointed time. There's an appointed time for every event under the heavens, as it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. God will be there on time, at the right time. Have you ever had little children? When do they want what they want? Now. now. Okay. So what's the why of faith? Why, why does God give us faith and what is faith all about? Why do you have faith? Well, I, I seem to think from what I've heard, you know, Alice and I have been blessed. We have traveled a great part of the world and preached and taught in and fellowshiped in churches of probably 25 different denominations. And I've heard so many people preach on this now faith. And it's like, now you got to get it. You have to have it right now. And why do you have it? You have it so you can get. You can get this and you can get that. You can get a new job. You can get a new car. You can get a new house. You can get a boyfriend, a girlfriend. All the things you want. Why? That's not the why. 
You know, whatever was written in early times was written for our instruction. So let's go back to the Word of God. Back to Hebrews 11, that faith chapter. It says, by faith, Abel offered. He offered unto God. Hebrews 11.4. And then it says in verse 8, Hebrews 11.8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac, his only begotten son. Faith is about giving. Faith is about obeying. It gives you the power. It gives you the power to obey. It gives you the faith to offer to God. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 24, 25, and 26. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Uh, you know, really. It's not about what you... Faith doesn't give you the power to get. Faith gives you the power to give. Let me tell you something. It's not about God not blessing you. Faith doesn't lead to the, ble lead to the blessings. Yeah. I'm going to make that statement. Faith does not lead to the blessings. Check Deuteronomy 28. Faith leads to obedience. Obedience leads to the blessings. Check it out. Don't take my word for it. I've said this. Deuteronomy 28. What does faith do for you? It gives you the power to surrender to God and obey Him. And He takes care of you like loving father of little children. Do you know the account of Paul when he was being transported to Rome to be put on trial before the Caesar? On the ship. On the ship. He was being transported as a prisoner on board a ship to go from Caesarea Philippi in Israel to be transported to Rome where he would stand on trial before Caesar. But along the way, yes. and there's always an along the way, brother, I'll tell you what. Along the way, a storm rose up. Not a little storm, a monstrous storm, right? So monstrous that the ship in the midst of the storm sunk. Now, Paul was the only one that seemed to have a perfect peace on board that ship. I think there were 277 people on board that ship. Sailors, soldiers, other prisoners. Paul had a perfect peace. But they were shipwrecked. You know, things don't always seem to turn out right, looking at it in the natural. But God has a plan. Always. God has a plan. And God has a purpose. Paul was surrendered to God's plan, Paul was surrendered to God's purpose. So they are shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And when they do, no life was lost. They come up on the island, and they're, they're coming out of the, the water, having been shipwrecked. They're cold, they're wet, so they build a fire. And as they're building the fire, Paul is one of the men who's gathering firewood for this fire. And as he's doing that, he grabs a piece of wood, and pow! A serpent, a snake, leaps out and locks on. A deadly, a deadly snake. Tortoise. How do I know it was a deadly snake? Because the people who lived on the island and had experience, they looked at Paul and they said, that dude is dead. He's a goner. He's a goner. That's a paraphrase, but that's what they said. So what did Paul do? He's this man of faith. Did he fall on his face and start crying out to God? Did he start, did he gather, there were other believers there, a few other believers. Did he call them and say, please, quick, quick, pray for me? What did he do? You know what he did? He shook the snake off and kept on going. Maybe some of the things that you should do, some of the things that you encounter, some of the trials and tribulations, some of those things that go on in your life, you just need to shake them off and keep on going. You need not to get into a panic and start a prayer meeting, quick, help, 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 help. All you got to do is trust because God has already promised that he is at work, both to will and to work his good pleasure in your life. That he will cause all things in your life to work together for good when you are called to his purpose. If you have that kind of faith, you'll have a faith where you can just shake the, those attacks of the serpent off and keep on, continue on in perfect peace. Think about it. That's faith. Right? Mm -hmm. 
course, Paul was persuaded about that, right? You know why he was persuaded? I'm glad you asked. He was persuaded because what he said gives evidence of it in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Paul said, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? If God loved you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place on that cross, what good thing is he going to withhold? You do not have to convince God to be good to you. How much of your prayer life is about that, trying to convince God to do good to you? Why? Don't you, are, don't you have faith? Trust him. Don't we believe? Don't we trust in him? He's made a promise to you. He's with you wherever you go. He's your rear guard. He goes before you. He's your rear guard. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. It's that faith that overcomes the world. Speaking of which, Paul continued on in Romans 8, I'm starting in verse 37, and he said, but in all these things, all what things? Go read what Paul's life was like. Mm -hmm. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul was persuaded, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That list covers it pretty well, doesn't it? That's, that's it. <laughs> covers it all. It covers it all. When you get to that place where you don't have to go begging and pleading God, I mean, trust him. His desire is to bless you. His desire is to do good for you. His desire... He loves you so much that he put Jesus Christ on the cross in your place. Why do you think you have to beg him to do good for you? Okay, so here's the why, all right? Why, why do we have faith? Why do we need faith? Well, it's there in Hebrews 11. Let me read the second verse in Hebrews 11. For by it, faith, the men of old gained approval. Remember what I said in the beginning? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's Hebrews 11, 6, by the way. The thing that should be your great desire in life, in all that's going on in your life, is that you're pleasing God. That God is being glorified. If you know that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, then you don't need to be concerned about your situation or the straits that you're in. So what should you be seeking? The glory of God. Hallelujah. What you should be seeking when things go wrong, when those attacks happen in your life, you should be seeking the glory of God. What, what's in this for you, Lord? That's right. That will change your life. That's a, that is a faith-based, life-changing attitude. Mm -hmm. What's in this for you, Lord? Giving him thanks and praise. Like I said, the ultimate goal is not to get stuff, mm -hmm. but to hear when we meet him face to face. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, to please God. Because the only alternative to that, the only alternative to that, for somebody who thinks that they're a believer, would be to hear him say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. I pray that I will please God with my life. I pray that Alice will please God. I pray that my brother Mark will please God mm -hmm. for his glory. Mm -hmm. God will take care of all the rest. You have no need to be anxious. That's why Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. Trust in God. Trust in God. Don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you have given us the gift of faith. Lord, that you have spoken your living word into our hearts, into our lives, that we might know how we can trust in you, that we might have that attitude like Paul, that we are more than conquerors, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, but through it all, God, that you would be glorified, that your son, Jesus Christ, would be exalted and lifted up, high and lifted up. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can use us, that you can use the situations in our life to prove your love, to show your love. We praise you and thank you 
and we do give you all the glory yes. and we surrender all to you in Jesus name Hallelujah. well there we are think about it meditate on it more importantly do it just do it we love you love God you. bless you Jesus till next time you. yes he does yes he does yes he does God bless you and goodbye. Bye bye. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths to rest in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, as we live every day of our lives here on earth. We must put our trust and lives in the Lord.